Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group Assistance Sessions, Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action. This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Governance Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of governance that govern the operation of God's laws, gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws, and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 8th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, what am I going to have to learn about next? What's the next thing? <laughs> Okay, how much of that's going to impact my life? Okay. <laughs> is it worth knowing more? Or <laughs> okay, maybe ignorance is bliss. <laughs> yeah. Can you feel how uh, when we share things with you that uh, there's complications that arise? And, and mostly those complications that arise from sharing these truths with you are emotional, right? They're, they're based on emotional injuries that basically have, that feel opposite to the, the thing we're discussing. So, you know, that's something to consider when you're listening to these kind of things. Mm. It's always good to know. Always good to know. All right, let's look at one more thing there is to know. Governance principles. So this is another one of the order principles. So remember we're in the order principles session and governance principles are another thing that creates order in God's universe. So let's have a look at it. We've already seen a lot of how hierarchy works and you can see in the hierarchy, you can pretty much see how governance might work, can't you, by examining hierarchy. You can see the relationship between the two. But let's go through some of the terms. So governance principles will be discussed in relation to self-aware beings of free will. Now, the reason why we've made that statement is because every single, per every single thing in the universe is governed by something else. All right? And governance is either implied uh, through the law, or of course the law governs the creation. So, you know, in the diagram we did earlier, how we had the hydrogen, uh, our oxygen discussion, and those two things combine to form the new, the new creation, H2O. The, you can see that, that the laws automatically govern that thing. The laws that are created from the commingling of these two sets of laws automatically govern this thing, this new creation. So, so you could say that everything from the smallest, most infinitesimal particle right the way through to God's highest creation, is governed. And God's highest creation is governed by? By God, through a whole set of laws, obviously. So, so all beings are, are controlled by governance, but, but the control is instinctual in that the properties of the creation, so in the case of oxygen and hydrogen, they have specific properties. And the properties of the creation govern its very, control its very existence and how it's going to interact. Uh, power off, press any key to cancel. There we go. So, does that make sense? So, it controls, so it's instinctual control because basically, and when you say instinctual, obviously that implies a living creature. In this case, it's the properties. Which are, which are sort of the instinct of the matter, the properties of the matter, control how it's going to be governed. Right? And how external things impact upon its internal properties. And we can see when matter combines to form a new substance, that new substance has new laws and those new laws govern that substance and how that substance can now combine and how that substance can be now used as a component in more complex creations. So obviously um, governance applies to all creation. But we would like to talk about it more in line with how it, how it pertains to the human soul, right? rather than talking about all creation. 
Because with the human soul, there's, there's some other aspects to it, some of which are automated with parts of governance, but others are because, because you have the will. The, remember, Mary, in the Introducing Order Principles, discussed human will and how that impacts upon these principles. And that, of course, is something we need to be aware of. So since the human soul is a self-aware being with the ability to express free will, depending on development, it has now specific powers of governance which can be exercised through will, not just through its, the properties. Does that make sense? Or you could state it more accurately in that, uh, this way. Human will is a property of the soul. Human desire is a property of the soul. It's an attribute, a characteristic of the soul. That being the case, it has specific ways in which governance can be organised compared to the properties of other creatures which do not have will and desire as a part of their nature or their, their creation. So that's why we would like to introduce that concept with you here. Now, we go to energy. You've seen the energy description before, right? So that's information, energy, emotion, thought, communication, relationship or interplay between creations, between any creation. Now, there's two new, principle, two new terms here we'd like to discuss with you. Development increases in quality and capacity as the human soul lives in more harmony with God's principles and decreases as the human soul lives in less harmony with God's principles. So now we're introducing this term development, which is not the same as the development principles. This is a, just a term relating to what it means to be developed as a human. Right? Uh, when I say it's not related to development principles, obviously uh, development principles determine it. But here we're defining development as increasing in quality and capacity as we get in harmony with God's principles and decreasing in quality and capacity if we get out of harmony with God's principles. So your, you could describe it as your current condition of development, if you like. Does that make sense? Yep. Power of governance is the energy able to be expressed by the human soul which varies in quality and capacity in direct relationship to development. Does that make sense? So, power is the amount of energy the human soul can utilise or use depending upon its developmental condition at this moment or at any one moment in time. Yeah. So we're right up to there. Do you have any questions about that? Because it's quite important to understand that before we move on. We're going to refer to development and power. Now power of governance is automated. This is not the power that you would express through desire or will specifically, but rather the power that all creation has of governance, depending upon it, the commingling of the particular laws that, go, that combine to cause this new element to form an existence. But in this case, we're saying there's this additional factor for humans. The human factor is now there is this additional thing called development, which, because the human is the only being that is able to independently operate in or out of harmony with God's principles. All other creation operates in or out of harmony with either the human's developed condition or God's principles, depending on which one has the most powerful immediate effect over the creation. Do you understand what I mean by that? So basically what we're saying is if there's a human soul, right, and there's an animal, <laughs> right, the human soul being higher, a higher creation, is higher in hierarchy than this animal, 
It also has power of governance over this animal, not only because it's a higher creation. It's not only because of that. And, it's, and the type of power that it has over this animal is not just because it's a higher creation, but also because it can be developed negatively or positively. The human soul can be developed positively or negatively and therefore have a, a less limited control or a more or higher control over the lower creation. So the lower the development of the soul means it reflects upon the condition of the animal. And the animal starts doing what the human soul's condition is rather than what God's principles would normally dictate if the human soul was not there. Because God's principles involve the power of the human soul being the pinnacle of God's creation. So it's still in harmony with God's principles because the human soul is the thing engaging that principles. And so there's this subsequent flow on effect. And this is where we need to start seeing the difference between hierarchy, which is just basically a positional place in the universe, compared to governance, which is actually the power of, or the, the ability to exercise power over other creatures in the universe and, what, and how that power is exercised and displayed and reflected in the other creatures in the universe. Does that make sense? So let's uh, have a look at it. These governance principles firstly ensure that everything is under the control of God's authority. All right, so the very pinnacle of authority being God and anything that, can, that contains a constituent element that God created, God already has some kind of authority over. Now, not everything in the universe is a part of God's creations. Because you, as an independent creator, have the ability to create things that God would not create. Right? And God gave you that ability. But everything that's a part of your creations, that also involved a part of God's creations, obviously God has authority over the bit that was created by God, not the bit that was created by you. Right? He's... And if that bit created by you is out of harmony with God's principles and laws, then it will, God's laws will be trying or attempting to destroy it. But some of your creations, completely under your control because there is no constituent elements that God had as a part of that creation. So sin is an example of that. Every time you create a sin, there is no constituent element in the sin that's a part of God's creation. And so you, God does not have control over the removal of, of that sin. You have control over that. Does it make sense? God won't remove it unless you want him to. And even then God won't remove it unless there's a whole heap of laws you engage to ensure he's involved in the, in the destruction of it. So God's laws control and govern all of creation. So we can see that through our basic diagram, that basic circular diagram we've been using. God's laws allow human souls to share governance. See, normally, if the human soul didn't exist, basically God would have authority over all, with there being a hierarchy of instinctual-based authority underneath that. But because the human soul now becomes a part of the creation, the human soul being the only creature with desire and will, then the human soul now is actually... God, God's involving the human soul in sharing governance of the rest of the creatures and the rest of creation. So this tells us that God wants us to learn about how to exercise authority. And God wants us to understand the relationship between poor governance and subsequent results of poor governance, the cause and effect issues between governance and its results. Each human soul automatically governs. So you are automatically governing right now. Whether you believe it or not, you are. But the power of governance is determined by development. Now remember, in our previous screen, development was the capacity of the human soul to live more in more harmony or less harmony with God's principles. Does that make sense? So 
So the power of governance depends upon how much you live in harmony with God's principles or how much you live out of harmony with God's principles. Does that make sense? So if you live in more harmony with God's principles, you have a higher power to govern. If you live in less harmony with God's principles, there is a lower power to govern as a result of that. And the human soul is the only creature that has that as a part of its inbuilt rules because of the gift of free will. So there we go. There's our governance principles. Bit of blank faces there about that one. <laughs> Let's maybe have a look at some examples and just see how we go with them. So this gives you an example. The human body is governed by gravity, right? Unless the human soul itself learns of a higher law which can overcome gravity. Now, the human soul in an ignorant condition has because of its development, a lower capacity to govern. If it's ignorant of the law of aerodynamics, it cannot use the law of aerodynamics. It makes sense, does it not? Whereas a creature with inbuilt instincts, such as a bird, is able to use the law of aerodynamics independent of development. But the human can only use the law of aerodynamics if he develops. You can see the difference? How will is actually imposed upon the law when it comes to the human. Yeah? So Jed, you would like to ask? In that context, are you talking about development being equal to learning or yes. equal to experience? Well, development is just... Become, remember we said the definition of development was come, becoming in harmony with God's principles. And one of God's principles is, for the human, is not to be ignorant, but to learn the law. So learning is a part of development, that's for sure. So you gaining more knowledge even, even if it's just intellectual, is a part of your development. And a person with higher development can engage higher laws. So if you learn more natural laws, for example, then you'll be able to engage those natural laws. That's independent of development in other areas, such as emotional development, right? But obviously it follows that if you develop emotionally, you, there might be even higher laws you can engage. Makes sense, right? So yes, the process of learning is a part of your development, whether that learning be physical, emotional or spiritual. And remember, we've defined that already. And would you say that is different to what you experience? Uh, no, because experience is a part of learning. But remember, for many of us, we are experiencing the world's concept of things. And so some of our learning is actually the opposite of what we would learn if we were experiencing God's concept of things. So some of that learning can't be included in development. That's a degradation of your development. So when you've, you know, like for all of us, we've learnt the, the world's way of loving. That's been a degradation in our development. Once we learn God's way of loving, the facts about God's way of loving, then it increases our development. When it comes to learning the facts about gravity and the facts about aerodynamics, that's in harmony with God's way of development. And you can see that, as we discussed in the previous groups, we have a tendency to look at the physical things and develop in those. So we find physical development relatively easy and we find spiritual and emotional development much more difficult. Right? So, but, but it all is involved in development, the whole lot. So don't think that, not, that learning something physically is not, uh, is not development, because it is. Thank you. Yep. So the process of learning, right, which is a process of development, and it's development in harmony with the facts, and so therefore it's development in harmony with God's principles, right? The process of learning allows the soul to develop more knowledge, which then allows, using different laws that it's gained knowledge over, to overcome the limitations of other laws, like, for example, the law of gravity. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
So can you see how that works? We've got the human body governed by gravity. Unlike a bird, which is no longer governed by gravity because it has inbuilt rules and inbuilt properties that allow it to overcome gravity, the human soul to overcome gravity has to learn in order to overcome it. Right? So in this way, it's very, very different to the rest of creation in that the rest of creation does not have to learn what it instinctually already does. And in fact, the rest of creation is not even really aware that it does what it does. So, you can, so since a bird is not self-aware, it doesn't really, it's not really aware of how it engages flight. It just has all of the instinctual and law-based requirements for flight built into it. And so therefore it can fly. Right? But the human can engage flight. Even you can engage flight without a machine. But to do that, you would have to learn the laws that are involved in that condition. Makes sense, right? So there we go. So I'm actually saying you can fly, but you have to learn the laws. <clears throat> now we can create a device using the current known laws to benefit ourselves. So whatever the current known laws are collectively and individually, those current known laws can now be used to govern the, our ability to engage the law of aerodynamics. Right. But they have to be known, they have to be discovered, they have to be understood. You can't just... Uh, and in fact, some of the pr earlier principles we learned, um, you, you can see that those principles preclude certain things from ever happening until you understand the law. And this is the case for the human in particular. Oops, the law of attraction. The human soul automatically governs by the soul's developed condition. So you know the law of attraction that we've been talking about a lot, right? Well, that, that's an example of governance in action, automated governance in action. The law of attraction works because your current condition, which is your current development, your current development in or out of harmony with the principles, determines your current condition, and that soul's developed condition determines what happens around it and what events it attracts automatically. Right? Now, you can control that through understanding or you can just bear with it without understanding. At the end of the day, it will still do its job. The law of attraction will still work, whether you understand it or you don't. Right. So it's automated, just as, as economy and function would dictate. It's automated. And on top of that, it depends upon your developed condition as to whether you will engage it with, positive, with, with a positive consciousness of the law or whether you engage it in an unconscious condition where you're not conscious of the law and how it works. But the law will still work because it's always going to work the same way under the same conditions. Yep. So that's an example of governance principles at work that you're not having any control over, but you could choose to have control over if you so desired. Yep. The condition controls substances, so the soul's developed condition, controls substances, creatures and events in harmony with the law so that the soul attracts these resources to aid in exposing to itself its current developed condition. Now, the, the clever thing about this law is that it attracts, your condition attracts a whole series of events and things, substances, creatures, events, to you in order to help you see your current developed condition, which is the thing that causes the attraction. It's a very clever way of God saying to you, this is your condition. Uh, very, very clever law of attraction. As you can imagine, because it's a soul-based law, 
it has to be one of the highest laws. But it's not just a soil-based law, is it? Because it also applies to things like the hydrogen and oxygen. They have an attraction due to inbuilt things that describe that attraction, properties that describe the attraction. So hydrogen and oxygen have a law of attraction. Governing, have the law of attraction governing them, just like we have a law of attraction governing us based on our developed condition. So the law of attraction goes right down to the smallest particle, right the way up to God's largest creation. But it, to understand it, the human soul must discover it and come to an understanding of it to see how it can utilise it. This human soul can utilise it. Whereas hydrogen and oxygen don't have to discover it, they just do what the law demands. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yep. And the reason why is because hydrogen and oxygen have inbuilt properties that state that's what the law demands, whereas there's an additional inbuilt property in the human soul that says you're going to be governed by will and desire as well as an inbuilt property. So therefore, will and desire becomes a factor in how the law of attraction works. So the governance principle ensures these attractions occur to aid the soul in its own self-awareness. So the law of attraction is an amalgamation of many, many principles, actually. You can see it's an amalgamation of love and truth. It has function and uh, economy in it. You can see it has developmental principles built into it. And in addition to that, it has hierarchy principles built in it and governance. So it's actually a very complicated law. It mixes many, many of God's principles all together in one law and then applies that to every creation. Yeah. Just got to keep an eye on my time because it's... Yes, I definitely need to keep an eye on my time. All right, so here's another example of the soul. Environmental responses. The soul is like a transmitting antenna with all the signals going out of it, sending to its environment its own governance condition. So your governance condition, which is based on development, you could say your governance condition is the power your soul exercises based on development. Your governance condition is transmitted to the rest of the universe. And what comes back to your soul is the reflected signals based upon that attraction. So each external creation responds individually and collectively to the individual and collective soul condition. The governance condition of the soul is driving it. Right, so here we have a soul pushing out, it's like an antenna, remember it's pushing out energy the governance condition is an energetic field. It is actually a field of energy right, pushed out into the universe, reflecting the soul's condition of governance. And that condition will affect all other creations, including other human souls who allow that condition to enter them. So it will affect everything. So we see that... The humans individual and collectively make decisions and choices based upon condition that are either in and out of harmony with love. So every, every decision this is making, in or out of harmony with love, every decision, remember, in harmony with love is in harmony with the principles. So therefore, a higher power level results. Every reflected condition that is out of harmony with love is lower, right, in its in its alignment with God's laws and principles. So therefore, there is a lower level of power and therefore it can affect less things. So if you have a very developed soul standing next to a very undeveloped soul, which soul is going to have the most power over its environment? The very developed soul. Because the very undeveloped soul has less ability to transmit as much governance energy to its environment because of the law. Does that make sense? 
So this results in either improving the balance or creating more imbalance in the environment. And the results can be measured. There is a proportional relationship between the developmental condition of the soul and its power of governance over its external environment. And it's also the case that the developed condition of the soul, there's a, there's a, there's a relationship between that and its internal ability to, power, to govern even its own bodies. Even its own bodies are, are a lower creature, so therefore under the control. So the reality, if we have a developed person standing next to an undeveloped person, the developed person can actually, oh, through its power of governance, can influence the undeveloped person's bodies. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because he has a higher power of governance. Now, of course, the undeveloped person might use his will directly in disharmony with that influence, which, which might then appear to be like he's not being influenced. But at the end of the day, he's being influenced because the other person, the power, more powerful person, has a higher power of governance. So this is how you can get to control the spirits who are around you. They might be in a lower condition. You might be in a higher condition. The higher your condition, the more prospect you have of being able to have less influence from those spirits. But also, when those spirits come around with you to other people, when other people are in your company, those spirits will have less control over those other people. And as soon as you get out of their company, those spirits go mad on those other people. <laughs> because they, they, those other people don't have a lower power of governance. Does that make sense? Many of you have experienced that in my company, where I walk out the door and you get attacked by spirits. You, why didn't it happen when I was with you? So you'd never considered that. It's because of my high power of governance. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's quite simple. And that's because of development condition, me living in more harmony with God's principles. That's all it's because of. So you have the same ability, it's just how many of God's principles do you want to break and how many of God's principles do you want to uphold? That's really what it gets down to in the end. You see? Okay, so is that pretty simple? You see how that works? Yeah. Okay, now we could use the example of human bodies, but I think we've had enough of that. Uh, we can see how it's all working. Let's look at our conclusion to the matter. So governance principles ensure that God has authority over everything and ensures that each creation with free will and self-awareness does automatically and can do with education and knowledge affect and control the positive or negative development of this environment. Right? So governance gives us, as humans in particular, because we're the ones with free will, the power to not only control self, but also to control the environment to a large degree. Negatively or positively. Now, what do we do with this particular principle? Well, we're pretty much against this principle. <laughs> we don't take control of our own creations. So, for example, we blame God for sin. We blame God for disease. We blame God for suffering. We blame God for <laughs> sickness and accidents. All of these things are under our control. governance. And yet we're blaming someone else for them. So they're all under our governance, under our control. We desire authority and power without love or development. You see that a lot, right? We want to have power, but we don't have the love. I see that a lot in relationships where the person who's the most loving in the relationship gives away their power to a person who's less loving in the relationship. Right? Now, if they were really living in harmony with the principles, that person who had a higher level of love, he wouldn't give away his power. He or she wouldn't give away his power in that. They'd actually draw the line. No, that's, that's it now. That's what they'd learn to do, right? So we do this a lot and we desire power without love or development. So many of us want to have a position. You'd be surprised how many people have come up to us. In fact, probably half of you guys at some point have come up to us and say, could you tell me what God wants me to do? And I want to discover what God wants me to do and so forth. Well, that's you giving up your power to actually choose that for yourself, isn't it? Really. And also the feeling coming from you is that you want a special position. 
And I'm going, well, I can't give you any special position in the Divine Truth Organisation because at the end of the day, you're demonstrating to me that you have a too low condition to allow that to occur through your actions or behaviour, you see. We also do this, we create without the ability to govern. So a good example of that is like, um, well, there's probably thousands of examples of that. You know, you create an insecticide, you spray it, but you don't have the ability to know all of its subsequent effects. Does that make sense? So what happens? You're creating without the ability to govern, and so now there's a whole heap of negative effects that you can't even predict or don't even know. And then later down the track, not only you, but other people in society are paying for those effects. And there's been some cases in historically, in recent years, where, and I'm saying the last 60 or 70 years, where we've created insecticides and stuff like that, that actually have the potential to destroy not only a large amount of life on Earth, but also all life. You start looking at sort of like things like atomic weapons and so forth. That's the creations that we've made that we have no easily easy ability to control if it's unleashed. So very unwise creation, right? <laughs> yeah. We deny the effect of their governance over other creatures. So we deny our effect over other creatures. So this is one, another thing I see. People go, yeah, but animals eat animals, so we should eat animals. And I'm going, animals eat animals because we eat animals. Do you know what I mean? We're denying that we have an effect over what we're measuring. But we do. We, have, we are the ones who have the highest power of governance. Therefore, we are the ones that have the highest effect. And, and so then measuring our effects and then justifying our action is, the, is the, in my opinion, the, the, a state of lunacy. It's sort of, like, it's sort of like saying, creating all of these effects and then saying, those effects are the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and it's totally illogical. Right? But we do it all the time. So there's, there's many things to do with governance that uh, we have trouble with. All right, well, what we'll do now is just have a minute break while myself and Lena change over, and then we'll deal with some of the questions that you've asked. So our discussion now is governance principles. It's a question and answer session of governance principles. So remember that uh, that's the summary of what we presented about governance principles everything being under God's control and then God's laws governing creation and allowance of the human soul to govern it and the human soul governing based upon its power and development. So let's look at some of the questions. So Jane, you, if I could look at your third question. Thank you. Have you, have you got them in the right sequence? Have I got them? Or? I believe so. Yep, fire Does away. God educate? Is that one? Go on. Um, no, that's not the third one. You say that in it. An objective okay. of governance. You say that an ob objective of governance principles is to ensure that creations of the human soul that are out of harmony with God's principles are eventually destroyed. Could war be an example of that? Um, yes, but it's probably a pretty, um, like, like many things, you probably think there are far many more examples. You know, it gives you some examples. Um, money is a human creation. It is currently being used out of harmony with most of God's principles. So God wants it destroyed. Now, for most of you, that would create a lot of problems. Because most of you make almost every decision or base almost every decision on the amount of money you have. Can you see that? So that would automatically create quite a lot of problems if it was destroyed, wouldn't it? If the money was destroyed. What, how would you live? What would you do? How would you transfer? How would you give and receive? What would you do then? How would you, how would you live? What, what, how would you get enough food for the day? How would you get enough clothes? Where would you get them from? What would you, you know, there's so many questions that would raise from that one issue. So what I notice is that like, we are constantly in belief that what we have made as a human race is necessary for survival when the reality is that much of what we have created as humanity will need to be destroyed if we are ever going to have a functional society. And war, of course, is one way that we are dysfunctional. 
but it's one of many millions of ways we are dysfunctional. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jana. Um, both of your questions I want both. to answer, so one okay. at a time. Yep. Uh, if governance ensures restriction of those in lower development, why do ev evil people seem to be in power on earth? Isn't that a good question? Yeah, well, well thought out question. All right, well, let's explain how evil people get power on earth. We've already partially explained it, haven't we? Yep. Can you see that? Because remember we had the discussion of the soul that is receiving love from God compared to the soul that is not receiving love from God. So the, the soul that not receiving love from God has limited power of governance. So, so, and it's not, so we could just write that there maybe, limited power of governance. So how does it get its power of governance? The only way it can get it from is other, other little souls yeah. who agree with giving power to that individual. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you've got the US elections uh, today, oh. aren't they? Yes, uh, today. We've got an example there of some people who are, who are being offered as the person who will be in power, who are in a fairly limited form of development. Mm -hmm. yeah. But other people have given them power through this agreement with this process. And most of that happens through what is called codependent addictions. I'll give you this power if you give me this. And that's, in fact, how the US government works, isn't it? That's how, that's how a prospective uh, US president can raise 700, 800, 900 billion dollars for their, just, just for their, um, campaign by making decisions which trade individual addiction with individual addiction. The addiction for power with the addiction for other things to get some kind of subsequent result. So this little soul that has limited power of governance in its own right is now being given power of governance through other people. Now you imagine if those other people happens to be millions of people Now, of course, there's this illusion that this person has a lot of power. And I say it's an illusion still because from God's perspective, they still have the same power they've always had. The same power that anybody else in the same condition has. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. But unfortunately, there's the illusion of this person now having power because millions and millions of people agree and support this person's position. All right. Mary, you'd like to say? Say, ask. Um, say or ask. Yeah. And isn't it fair to say that the power is limited or it's dependent upon many other people, so therefore it's actually quite limited in its uh, p potential? Or yeah, power. to a large degree, this person becomes controlled by every person who's given them something in return doesn't don't they yep. so it's not real power mm. is it they're, they're just controlled by they've had to give a kick back here and a put there and a this there and a that there and a bit of money here and a bit of dough there and a bit of a decision here and whatever they've had to do all these things so can you say that this person is actually free to make their own choices and decisions mm. no they're not and the reality is uh, someone like the US president is not free to make their own choices and decisions. In fact, the reality is there's very few people on earth who are free to make their own choices and decisions, even though they have the illusion of a lot of power. Does that make sense to yeah. that? Yep. Yeah, so that sort of fits together with how... So the power of governance from God's perspective is all about love entering the soul, of course. Mm -hmm. so, so one soul in a state of love is able to overcome all of this, actually. Right? If these all allow that. But these, of course, have free will. They have the choice. And they may make, in that condition that they're in, they may make a choice to kill the body of this one's. Right? They can make that choice, can't they? 
So then they have the illusion of having power, but do they really? They still really don't, do they? They have the same power they've always had. It's just collective, joining together collective power, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Okay, second question. Um, do God's law apply to desires and not just action because she knows that at some point in the future it will be acted upon? Yes, so yes, desire will probably in the future be acted upon. And so one of the reasons why God's laws applies to desires and not just actions is because God wants to correct desires that are out of harmony with love because it, God knows that desires out of harmony with love are the causes of actions out of harmony with love. So God's trying to stop the problem at the seed of the problem, the, the cause of the problem, not the effect. And this is a large difference between human laws and God's laws is that humans wait until you've acted and then take an action. So, so for example, a human, uh, humans have this inbuilt thing in law that a person has to do something wrong before they can be incarcerated. Well, God incarcerates souls before they do something wrong. Because <laughs> he know he can measure the desire. Remember, desire is a mathematical equation within the soul. So, and God has, uh, has the sensitivity in his own soul to measure it. And so therefore, now that he has the, desire, the feeling to measure it, he knows how to measure it, he can now act upon it. The beauty of acting upon desire rather than action is that you can stop an action before it actually takes place. Right? Now, of course, if humans tried to put that in action, there'd be a disaster on the planet because most of us have no idea how to even sense somebody else's real feelings or desires. Right? But in the spirit world, the higher you get in development, the more you have that sensitivity so that you can then now measure desires. So if you had a person on earth who was like a judge or someone who could measure desires, wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah. yeah. And imagine a million of them who could all measure desires. Now we could start addressing co problems way before they actually were acted upon. And that would be fantastic. But that's only possible with development the development of love entering the soul so yep but you're right uh, that's the reason why god has done those things yep. yeah yeah good question i yep. um, sherry hey. uh, by the way is there any questions about one of those two questions that you'd like to ask because i saw a few hands up if we go yep just uh, sorry what's your name gabby that's right I was just going to ask okay. I was going to ask you about that transaction. Yeah, this one? Yeah. Yes. So the man in power or the woman in power is actually degrading in the soul condition as the other souls are feeding the facade of that person in power. Yeah. So yeah. they're all degrading as a result. They're all of degrading that. as a result. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And therefore they all collectively will eventually have no power. If they keep doing it. You so know. the whole thing starts to degrade. Yes, of course. So, so the whole system will be degraded. Whatever they create will be degraded. Whatever they create will be out of harmony with love as a result. Yeah, there's, it's impossible to create a loving system based on that method of governance. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so if we examine this more completely, I see a lot of you doing that in relationships, actually. Okay. What happens usually in a relationship is you've got husband or wife who has the power so many of you are only interested in power in a relationship and that's why you're together and so one has power over the other and the other gives that person power so it's really a power play and you're doing exactly the same as this exactly the same in relationship you give one the power and you receive power to that one without considering the principles, without considering any of God's principles in the process, and as a result, there's a degradation of the entire family following the power of that one individual. Make sense? Very, very common. Okay, Nat, you would like to ask on the subject, on that subject? Um, I understand from what you're saying that this is how groups of spirits are controlled by so-called ringleaders. Yes. But from a spirit body perspective, the people that are giving their energy to these ringleaders, are the ringleaders 
energetically more powerful or is it the same illusion that we're seeing here? No, because uh, yeah, from a spirit perspective, you are, when you give, uh, when you accede your will to another person's desires, you are literally giving them energy. Uh, you remember your emotions and your will and your desires are all energy systems. Remember yep. we defined yep. energy systems. It includes emotion, thought, communication. So that's the energy system. So what's happening is you're, you're, you're giving energy. So we're, even by having a thought in agreement with somebody, you're actually giving that person energy. Without, you might not have even voiced it. Even just the thought that you know, they're right even if they're wrong, and that you think they're right, you are giving them energy. Wow, oh, okay. Does that make sense? It is an actual energetic transaction which God can measure. There's even a scientific equation that defines it. <laughs> and so it can exit your spirit body, enter theirs. It actually exits your soul and enters theirs. Okay. Right? Yep, thanks. Yep. So we need to understand that, that even our thoughts are even thoughts in agreement without even being voiced are energetic transactions with the person you agree with. Interesting, huh? This is why God measures them. Because they do actually add to... In the spirit world, you see them as little, like, email parcels. <laughs> well, you've seen that described, haven't you, in the Robert James Lee's material? They're just like little email parcels. Thought, bang, that is energy. That will create, that will have a creation. That will have some result somewhere if the person on the receiving end of the thought allows it, it will have an effect. So it's not just your feelings. Your feelings, of course, drive them. But it's not just your feelings that are energetic transactions. Huh? Okay, let's move on to some of these other questions. Um, Sherry. Um, yeah, far away, I think you only had one question, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, is there a restriction on scientific knowledge in built into the world systems? So is there a restriction on scientific discovery and knowledge? Yeah, so that, like, to stop us completely destroying the planet or something, for example. Yes, I understand the question. So, so it's a good question. The reality is... Um, the law of governance almost imposes the restriction to a degree, doesn't it? Because the lower the developmental condition, the less ability you have to govern. So therefore, the less ability you have of knowledge, the less ability you have to discover, the less ability you have of everything. So, so historically, the human race went from a fairly good developed condition and then with Amon and Amand, the first human couple, and then they went downhill very rapidly to the point where we lived like 25 to 30 years of age. Very few people thought anything more other than sex and food, and that was it. There was a very low developed condition, and everybody just did whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, however they wanted. There was no very little law, very little their very little condition of development. As a result, they couldn't discover how to fly, they couldn't discover how to use technology, they couldn't discover any of those things as a result. Does it make sense? And that's a natural state of the undeveloped condition. Now, that doesn't mean that God's placing a restriction on scientific knowledge, though, because the reality is God's trying to make all of this knowledge available, but the knowledge can only become available through developed condition. So the law of power, the law of governance, the principle of governance, really defines how much scientific knowledge we're able to actually finish up gathering. So if a man and a man had not turned away from God, mm -hmm. we'd be potentially in an incredible state developmentally. Well, remember, desire to turn away from God is an individual decision. So they may have decided not to turn away from God, but their children may have decided to turn away from God. Okay. So, so that being an individual decision, yes, a man and a man would have benefited from that individual condition, and certainly their children would have benefited from that potential of no longer having the same restrictions that a man and a man had on them. But at the end of the day, it doesn't guarantee that the children would have chosen any different. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Because yeah. that is an individual choice and decision. So everything's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For those of you who have a tendency to blame them for everything, <laughs> you need to reconsider your belief system. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Deidre, can we... Who are you? Over there. And uh, um, where's Yvonne? She's over there. We can have one there with Yvonne as well. Didri, how am I going? Time wise, just double check. Time, I keep closing my timing book, so I just got to open that. Okay, not very, I might not get to them because there's a few other more important ones I want to ask. So, Didri, fire away. Why is it so hard to fathom that God loves and loves giving and sharing power and wants to? Well, this is more of an emotional question associated with your human law hangover. The human law hangover, remember, is specifically related to your parents and your caregivers. The reality is that parents do not want to hand over power. In fact, most parents want to take power over their children. That's how they enforce their children's behaviour. So instead of enforcing their children's behaviour through encouragement of proper behaviour, through penalty of unloving behaviour and so forth, they enforce children's behaviour through just based upon power issues. I want to dominate my child. I want to own my child. I want to tell my child what to do. I want to make sure my child does what I want them to do and so forth, right? Now that creates this hangover in the adult which then believes that every person in authority doesn't want to share power. Every person in authority is about taking, 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 not giving. Right? And this is where that emotion comes from. Thank you. You follow? Yep. Yvonne. Um, how does God give more power to those in higher development and restrict power to those in lower development? So I think we've pretty much demonstrated that. The way God gives power to those in higher development is that basically the soul in a higher developed state has more knowledge, more emotional capacity, more, therefore more energy. And since the soul has more energy, it now has the power to govern more things based on development. So, so if the, the development increases, so too the energy increases, so too the power of governance. And that's really how God does it. Now, God also has the ability to give us personal attributes of God, if we so desire, which greatly and substantially change our levels of energy, which therefore obviously increases this exponentially to become more godlike, therefore increasing development in the same manner, so therefore the power of governance is much more greatly increased. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So it's quite simple the way God does that. Thank you. Yep. Um, if we go to David Raisman, up to back there. If we can have your first question first. Sure. Okay. If we have governance over God's creations, can we impact animals to the point where they no longer honour their inbuilt rules? Um, well, it depends. You see, every one of the inbuilt rules in animals is that they are going to reflect the human condition. That's actually an inbuilt rule. So, So... The reality is they will still honour that inbuilt rule, one of, which is one of their primary inbuilt rules, actually. So, so if I illustrate that perhaps here. Oh, I'm loving how easy that is to come off now. <laughs> Thank you, Eloisa, for sorting all that. Um, so we've got the shot soul. We've got the animal. Right? And what we're looking at is, he, here is this, we're saying, can this soul impact this animal so much that its own inbuilt rules no longer function? Yeah. That's really what we're saying. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, no, because one of the inbuilt rules of that animal is that it will respond to that soul. You follow me? Okay. And all of the inbuilt rules in that animal are controlled by God's principles, not man's. 
Do you follow? So the the inbuilt rule that it controls the animal, the, the inbuilt rules still control the animal. But the animal has been made to be sensitive to the soul's desires and actions. So it'll just continue to degrade. So if the soul degrades, the animal's condition will degrade. Yes. Yep. But that's a part of its inbuilt rule. So the inbuilt rules themselves are still being honoured. Do you see what I'm saying? Makes sense. Yep. So the inbuilt rule is still on it, is still govern, still governing the creation, the creation. But one of the inbuilt rules happens to be that the soul will influence the creation, and so therefore, if this soul degrades, so too will the animal's reflection of that degraded condition. Yep. Makes sense, doesn't it? It does. Yep. Okay. Your second question. Sorry. It's all right. Can we degrade to the condition where we no longer impact other things in an unloving way? Yeah, in other words, can we get so bad in condition that no longer can we influence anything unlovingly? Yeah. So that might be a goal rather than becoming loving, is that the idea? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good question though, uh, from a practical perspective, you can see that some people might consider it, right? The reality is that, uh, yeah, so can we degrade to the condition where we no longer impact other things in an unloving way is the question. So we're basically saying, can this soul get so low in its developed condition that everything around it, that there's no energy at all coming out of it towards anything else? And the answer to that question is no, it can't. Mm. And can, can I say why? <laughs> why did God make it that way? Because a soul, when it engages its will, is already um, pushing out governance energy, no matter what direction that is in. So if you've engaged your will to degrade your condition, that governance energy is still being pushed out into the universe. There's nothing you can do about that. Remember, that's an automatic process of the soul. You can't... You can only control the amount of governance energy coming out of your soul by your developed condition. So sure, there will be less governance energy coming out of your soul, but at the end of the day, there is never none. For there to be none, the soul would also have to be dead. Does that make sense? Yep. And at this stage, nobody has ever seen a soul die. So, so then it's highly, un highly unlikely that the soul could ever get to the condition of it being dead and therefore never get to the condition of being able to influence something in its environment. However, obviously the lower our condition gets, the less energy can be manufactured. And what happens generally there is that these, then, these souls that get into this very low condition, let's draw them as little minute souls now because of their condition, right? They have to get together and amalgamate in purpose, right? To get a collective condition enough to influence something. Does that make sense? It does. So what they do, and this is what we notice on earth and in the spirit world, this happens on earth as well, is that souls are unable to affect a certain, certain condition by themselves decide to get together with every other person on that same subject and then exercise their collective energy. They gang up. Basically gang up on things. Yeah. Yeah? And of course if their intent is harmful then the subsequent result can be quite large if there's millions of them the subsequent result can be quite devastating. Yep. But they still have limited governance energy individually. And all that's doing is putting their li limited governance energy together into a collective and then exercising that energy as a collective. That's all that's doing. Yep. Okay. And humans are masters at that. Because we get so frustrated that we can't do something ourselves so what do we do? 
we still want the thing done, so we band together with a whole group of other people who want to do it too. And we give codependent addictions to each other to enforce the collection stays together. And off we go and do the thing. Mm. Yep. Okay, thanks. All right, Mary, you'd like to mention about that? Just, uh, just with reference to David's first uh, kind question? of first point you made. No, sorry, the second question, but the first point you made about yep. it. Yep. You're basically saying, aren't you, that the, that no matter how much we degrade, uh, we still have governance over lower creation because of hierarchy. Yes, but there's a lower right? amount of energy in that governance. Yes. Because of our degraded condition and development. Yeah. 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 So you can't ever, governance, you can never get rid of governance because hierarchy exists. That's right. And you yep. can never get rid of hierarchy because scope exists. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you can't get rid of these things. You can only imagine you don't have them or, or engage them, you know, one of the two. Yeah. And the second point was about this, this where you said the banding together. Yep. Now, when you did it as souls, but when we're in a spirit form or even in a physical form, because of the transference of energy from one soul to soul another, to so another, it's still a banding together of souls. Yeah, the actual spirit and physical body of the person can actually appear to have more development, can't it? Yes, I notice that a lot on earth. Not, not greatly though. Right. It only has the collective development of the in, of the collective desire. So most people who band together like this have quite negative, uh, what you would classify as unloving desires. So their whole condition of power and brightness is quite dark already. And all it does is it increases the power of that condition rather than increasing the brightness of the person. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I see that. But also there's like this other thing that can happen, isn't there? Like say for a person who has some development but a specific injury so therefore they have some development and energy but they can be manipulated by someone in a much lower condition to transfer their energy to that person mm -hmm. through just a specific injury well it's always a fear-based injury a fear-based injury yep. and can that actually transfer like quite a bit of that person's energy through their will yes if, yes it yes. can yeah. And this okay. is how many people in a very poor condition live a long time on earth. Mm. Because That's spirit they have spirits transferring energy to keep them alive so that the spirits can still get the benefit of having that person alive on earth rather than having to shift their awareness to another person and develop the whole thing again. So, yeah, it's a, it's a negative thing that happens. But the brightness of that soul, its developed condition, remains degrading. It continues to degrade um, as a person does that because it's based on addiction therefore out of harmony with all of God's love and truth principles yeah all right we must stop there because we've got our last one which is a very important principle to do so we're going to have now a 10 minute break if we come past come back at uh, it's 1507 so 1517 17 minutes past three be good and we'll get started on our last principle for the day Thanks, guys. Hey, can I just stop you for a moment? About more than half of this group has a very unloving condition of standing up before we finish talking. Uh, don't you think that shows a lack of respect for the presenter? Surely it does, doesn't it? So what's going on there? You're all in a panic to get <laughs> there and back in the time you've got. And you're forgetting love. So fear is dictating your love-based condition. So there's an example of fear dictating love-based condition and you're doing it every single session even though we're talking about love. Can you see how easy it is to ignore a principle? That's how easy it is. Anyway, I wanted to leave you with that while you go to your break. Now it's 18 minutes past that you come back. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.